hello everyone, and thank you for joining this breakout on energy intense industries. For the next half hour or so, uh, we'll be discussing uh, relevant uh, issues and applications with regard to energy intense industries and how energy storage can play a role. We'll first go through a few minutes of introductions with our distinguished panel, uh, then we'll take questions. So I remind you, please put your questions in the chat window and we'll try to get to as many as we can. My name is Cliff Hill. I'm a mechanical engineer at Sandia National Laboratories and I will again be facilitating this breakout session. Joining me today in this panel are Hannah Brunig, who's the deputy head of the Sustainable Energy and Environmental Systems Department at Lawrence Berkeley National Lab. She specializes in techno-economic analysis, process modeling, market analysis, and environmental and human health impact assessment of emerging energy and negative emission technologies. Ben Gilbert is a geoscientist at LBNL, leading the subsurface energy storage program domain that includes thermal, compressed gas, and hydrogen storage methods. Adrian Little is the vice president of systems engineering at Antora Energy, which electrifies heavy industry with thermal energy storage for zero carbon heat and power. And finally, we have Daryl Wilson, who is the executive director of the Hydrogen Council, a global CEO-led initiative of leading companies with a united vision and long-term ambition for hydrogen to foster the clean energy transition for a better, more resilient future. So again, welcome to all our distinguished panelists. Again, this breakout is on energy intense industries. And as you just heard from the lightning talk by our colleague, Prakash Rao, uh, this comprises a significant uh, amount of energy. And so we'll now go into some questions uh, regarding energy intense industry and how energy storage can play a role ultimately for helping to decarbonize uh, this sector. Again, I'd like to remind all the attendees to this breakout session. Uh, please put any questions you have into the chat window, and we'll try to get to as many as we can. I'd like to kick it off with a question regarding which industries do our panelists feel and see as low-hanging fruit for near-term decarbonization using energy storage? Hannah, you wanna take that? Sure, thanks. So in the lightning talk, as Prakash mentioned, the most energy intensive sectors are dominated by thermal demands, while only about 12% of their energy consumption is in the form of electricity. So there are real potential opportunities for energy storage in the near term to decarbonize these sectors by enhancing energy efficiency. That could be through uh, the recovery of and storage of waste heat, as well as the conversion of waste on site to thermal and electrical systems and being stored as needed. Food and beverage, industrial furnaces, iron and steel making are examples. However, industries where energy efficiency strategies will not help them meet their targets for decarbonization or for self-sufficiency and resilience in their energy and fuel consumption may be willing to be the first adopters for more novel energy storage particularly those that offer long duration energy storage, such as hydrogen and high temperature thermal energy storage. Important is to not just think about the industry sector, but also to think at the facility level and understanding where the co-location of facilities with wind and solar resources that require this energy storage are gonna be cited and could potentially be first adopters. Thanks, Hannah. Uh, Adrian, do you have anything to add to that? Yeah, for sure. Uh, so in terms of low hanging fruit, there's actually a lot of opportunities with respect specifically to steam production. This can be in a range of different temperatures as low as 150 degrees Celsius up to 300 and beyond. And what we're seeing is that these sorts of industries don't have a lot of options for decarbonization. Uh, there are things like being able to put in electric boilers and things like that, but the, the needs go a little bit beyond that. And so what we're seeing is some interest in, uh, let's say, heat as a service uh, sort of potential applications, beachhead markets, servicing customers that have these critical needs. Uh, of course, some of the challenges here is that uh, likely these markets are to, uh, to include uh, many different but smaller users of steam. 
And so coming up with a product that can service multiple applications with a solution that is fairly similar across those applications is, I would say, one of the big challenges here. Uh, another interesting part of this is uh, because of volatility in gas, natural gas prices and otherwise fuel prices, uh, in some cases, in order to have more predictability of operating costs for these various steam users, uh, the ability to use energy storage and a more predictable electricity price uh, to provide steam to their facilities is actually quite uh, attractive for a lot of these customers. So I, I would argue that's that's a very interesting beachhead market for energy storage. Yeah, great points. Uh, I'd like to remind those who are just joining this breakout on energy intense industries, uh, please put any questions you might have in the moderated q and I think there's actually maybe a couple locations, a chat and a moderated q and I was just informed. Uh, please, they'd prefer if you put your questions in the moderated q and I got another question for the panelists. What energy storage technologies do you believe are best suited for energy intense industries and why? Uh, Hannah, do you wanna kick us off there again? Absolutely, thanks. So we're starting to see some great examples of the coupling of energy storage with uh, energy intensive industries around the world. We're seeing uh, historically district energy systems have been used in Finland to handle waste heat and heat demand in the pulp and paper industry. We're seeing hydrogen starting to be used for the production of iron and steel making. We're starting to see uh, ice and other forms of thermal energy storage being coupled smartly with waste heat sources, as well as uh, the availability of variable renewable energy. And in particular, we need technologies that can deliver long duration storage if the goal is to smooth the supply of wind and solar uh, energy to facilities. If we need to meet high temperatures around 1000 or greater degrees Celsius systems, such as industrial furnaces, then the goal is to try and find ways to avoid transferring electricity directly to that high temperature and see if we can do that at times when it's cheapest. So thermal energy storage again offers a means of buffering that um, energy intensive process. Thank you. Thanks, Hannah. Uh, Daryl, do you have any comments on that one? And you might, I think you're muted, Daryl. Thank you. Thanks very much, Cliff. Yeah, hydrogen plays a very critical role here for energy intensive industries. And, and one of the reasons with uh, iron and steel and ammonia production is the hydrogen itself is chemically active in the process. So steel making is a process of, re of reducing iron into iron and, and hydrogen is chemically active in that process. So it's not only bringing an energy component into the mix, but a chemical component. Similarly, uh, when you're synthesizing ammonia, ammonia is uh, nitrogen and two uh, hydrogen molecules. So the, the very synthesis of, of, of ammonia involves hydrogen production. And you, the current method for making that hydrogen is with steam methane reforming, which releases indeed a lot of CO2. As you move to renewable electrolytic hydrogen, uh, you can eliminate that CO2. And ammonia is a very critical part of the process of developing and fertilizing food. Uh, so part of, uh, of how we feed ourselves in the, the whole uh, ammonia cycle and fertilizer cycle. Um, so one of the reasons that hydrogen is playing these critical roles at this scale is indeed the scalability. Many of the forms of energy storage that we use in the form of lithium ion batteries or, or smaller battery cells just don't have the capacity to bring the volume of energy to these processes that are required. On the other hand, hydrogen can scale into the gigawatt level and that's why we're seeing already in places like Norway and Germany, the first instances of projects for decarbonizing steel plants using uh, electrolytic hydrogen. So this is not just an idea, it's actually um, uh, projects have already been kicked off and will be shortly on the ground for decarbonizing these heavy sectors uh, using hydrogen. Great, thank you. Uh, one more, another reminder for those joining this breakout session, please put your questions in the moderated Q&A section of the platform, the online platform. Uh, we have our distinguished panel of guests answering questions on energy storage for energy intense industries. Okay, the next question, what are the biggest challenges you see facing carbon-free energy use and storage for different energy 
or industry end uses. Uh, ben, can you take that one? Thank you, Claire. Be pleased to. So as Daryl alluded to a moment ago, scale is a big challenge. Uh, in order to kind of meet some of the, the large-scale energy uh, storage challenge of some of the industries that were mentioned. So I'm pleased to be present to provide some perspective on the use of geologic formations to, to meet this challenge. So just, you know, in addition to hydrogen and thermal, uh, the Earth's subsurface is uh, a proven uh, location for large-scale energy uh, storage. So that's through thermal uh, chemical fuels, including methane and hydrogen, also mechanical energy storage, uh, but not electrical storage. Uh, and this means that the Earth's uh, subsurface can provide really large scale opportunities for storing energy from renewables. If you look uh, around the US and the globe, you see examples where, for example, the subsurface has been used to store hydrogen for decades, enabling uh, industrial clusters in locations such as Houston, Texas, Teesside in the United Kingdom, uh, to develop with a kind of stable, kind of large scale hydrogen uh, energy storage foundation. The, um, the opportunity really, in, in my view, is to expand some of these geologic energy storage options much more widely to enable you know, a wider range of energy intensive in industries to, to use this approach. So I think that the challenges are to perform some kind of near term R&D and develop the regulatory and risk frameworks to use existing and some non-traditional geologic formations for thermal and chemical energy storage. Uh, and I know there's, there's work going on in that field too. Uh, looking a little further ahead, I think there's also opportunities to, to bring some ingenuity to engineer subsurface settings uh, more creatively to achieve the thermal energy uh, storage needs that Hannah mentioned, for example. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, let's see, anyone else want to take uh, a stab at this one? Hey, I'd like to jump in here. Um, so taking a, a broad look at not just energy storage technologies, but let's say any first of a kind energy technology, including storage, uh, I would say the biggest challenge to getting these technologies out the door is actually putting steel in the ground. And what I mean by that is if you're making a product for an industrial application, this is likely to be in the multiple tens, hundreds of megawatts sort of application. Now, when you're a, a early stage technology or a startup company or something starting out of a lab, the key question is how do you build a thing at a meaningful scale and prove that it works to your future customer? And so this to me is the biggest bottleneck. You know, at, with an early stage technology, how do you A, find a site how do you B, get it permitted such that you can prove that it's safe to operate, even though it's essentially a test facility? And then C, once you have it running, what sort of data do you need to collect to prove the bankability of that technology to your future industrial uh, partners? And this, of course, is related to safety, but it's also related to things like uh, proving out the reliability of a system, since these industrial customers are very sensitive to the reliability of whatever technology, even more so than things like efficiency sometimes or even cost. And so I would say that, um, again, that's the bottleneck. How do you go about finding that site to build a thing at a meaningful scale? And so there's a lot of challenges related to getting those permits in, in terms of finding an uh, appropriate EPC that is flexible enough to help you build out that facility, uh, making sure that you have eyes on the design from a, a safety and code compliance standpoint, such that in the end, the thing that you build does in fact make sense to both uh, the needs of the customer, but also uh, longer term things like the bankability. Yeah, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And, and, and I know of your past experience with both Malta and now Antora, uh, you have a lot of <laughs> direct experience with some of those challenges. Uh, thank you. Let's go on to the next question. Again, for those uh, listening and uh, listening in, please put your questions in the moderated Q&A uh, section of the plat virtual platform. Okay, another question. How can decarbonization of energy intense industries support energy equity and justice? Uh, ben? Yes, thank you. I'd be happy to uh, contribute to this one. I, I think here again, the development of the Earth subsurface systems for energy storage really has some nice opportunities for energy, economic, and social justice uh, associated with the, the necessary transition to carbon-free economies. Uh, in a very big picture view, 
uh, since the Industrial Revolution, modern societies have been using the Earth for extraction of energy and resources. And I think the opportunity and challenge now is to change the paradigm a little bit to more uh, kind of uh, sustainably use the, uh, the subsurface for energy storage and recovery. Now, the good news is that there's uh, a large workforce in the United States and other com countries who have all of the skills to understand subsurface systems uh, that have been grown up through, for example, the oil and gas industry. And I think there's a, a real opportunity to transition that knowledge and skills to, uh, to enable folks to contribute to this carbon-free economy by kind of repurposing uh, their abilities and existing infrastructure to some of these energy storage challenges. And, yeah, thank you. Thanks, Ben. Uh, how about uh, Hannah, do you have any thoughts on this? Yeah, absolutely, thank you. So there are a couple pieces here where energy storage to decarbonize industry has an impact on local communities as well as communities across the globe. And the way to truly identify the people that are gonna be most affected by deployment is using systems analysis tools like life cycle assessment, where you're looking at the current picture and what the emissions, let's say there might be pollutants that affect pulmonary health in a local community, or it could be something as broad as uh, climate change. You have to do a comparison of the two decisions, the one you're currently doing, as well as the trade-off of using energy storage to deliver clean energy or to reduce your emissions. So you need to look directly at the local community as well as the uh, people affected by upstream production of energy or materials that you're gonna need to use. The other piece that's really key here is by uh, producing energy on site, storing it on site until using it on site, you can enable local energy economies. This can stimulate job creation in areas that might be suffering from changes in industry where they're currently thinking about clean energy as a threat. And instead we can change this picture to talk about rebuilding America in ways that promote different labor skill sets and uh, not just high skilled labor, but all sorts of uh, people can be involved. So that might require new approaches such as um, training that could be done in coordination with the deployment of technologies. Thank you. Yeah, those are good points. And with, with regard to workforce development that you and Ben brought up, hold that thought. Uh, there's a question on that that I saw coming in. Um, and, and the other point you made, um, on, on looking at total life cycle analysis and the impact, you know, I, I'm used to doing techno-economic analyses, but it's more on performance and cost. But I guess you could look at the cost to, to society. Um, and, and so those are really good points that we need to begin considering. Okay, let's move on to the next question I see here. And again, for those participating, please put your questions into the moderated Q&A section of the virtual platform. Um, what are some key opportunities to leverage clean hydrogen for both energy support and large scale clean energy transport and distribution for industry? Well, let me ask Daryl if you can take this one. Sure, thanks Clifford. Uh, often we don't have the energy generation capability uh, close to uh, where we want to use the energy. And so long distance transport of energy is a major part of our current system. And I think we're all freshly aware of that. And it's going to continue to be a major uh, point uh, in the future because the concentrated areas for renewable power generation are not proximate to the, some of the largest demand in the world. Um, one case study that I think is fascinating in this area is the country of Chile, a long coastal geography with some of the best solar irradiation and wind regime yields in the world. And in fact, the coincidence of solar and wind together give an overall yield profile, which is unequaled anywhere else in the world. Now they have the opportunity to produce 70 times more energy than they consume as a, a country. So with a renewed focus on moving renewable energy across boundaries and around the globe, Chile has been marketing their capability to produce clean hydrogen from these wind and solar resources at very high efficiency and very low cost. Um, so whole new opportunities are opening up for parts of the world like Chile, like Australia. Uh, in fact, also the Middle East with large desert uh, solar irradiated areas. Um, the, the long scale transport of renewable energy will show up in the form of hydrogen. 
Uh, our studies at the Hydrogen Council along with McKinsey show that any distance is greater than 500 kilometers, it's better to move that hydrogen as en uh, that energy as hydrogen than it is as electrons. Um, and this brings in one other dimension that I'd like to touch on very briefly, and that's the whole area of system stabilization and integration. Uh, sometimes we have the, the simplistic mindset that, you know, we're going to all drive a Tesla and have solar panels on our roof, uh, but that is not a comprehensive societal energy system. And when you start to look at the, the demands and the flows of energy and the balance between the electrical system, which has provided very immediate energy to keep the lights on versus the gaseous system, which brings huge amounts of energy storage capability, there's going to need to be a balance between electrification and a gaseous or molecular energy system in the future. And so uh, hydrogen is going to play a very critical role to balance the in increased levels of electrification that are envisioned right now. Thanks, Daryl. Uh Anybody else have any comments on this one? Maybe I can follow up because I think this issue of hydrogen transport is, is clearly key. And there's a more kind of uh, closer to home example uh, where in the, around the Los Angeles base, basin, uh, the High Deal LA project is seeking to develop uh, a commercial hydrogen hub and, and work on that is, is certainly underway. The closest uh, geologic storage site uh, is actually in Utah. So then the question becomes, you know, is it more appropriate to develop kind of long range hydrogen pipelines or are there other storage uh, opportunities uh, closer to the, the production and, and use? And, and here too, we're very interested in looking at kind of non-conventional geologic storage options, including for example, some of the depleted natural gas reservoirs of which California and very many other states in, in the US uh, have an abundant quantity. And the preliminary survey of California shows that there are really dozens of potential depleted natural gas sites up and down to Northern and Southern California, uh, which could provide kind of much closer to home opportunities, closer to the renewable energy sources, and potentially you know, form new locations for new industries, just as Hannah said a moment ago. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Ben. Okay, another question. We mentioned uh, workforce development in one of the earlier uh, questions about energy equity and justice. Uh, this question specifically asks, what workforce transition opportunities are there for energy storage and industrial decarbonization? Uh, Adrian, you want to take this one? Yeah, I'll jump in there. Uh, so the, the nice thing about a lot of energy storage technologies is that they leverage a lot of skill sets that are currently existing at, for example, decommissioned coal power plants or other flavors of power plant that are becoming less popular with time. And so if you think about it, uh, a lot of uh, thermal energy storage technologies, they have things like pipes and valves, they need large concrete foundations that need to be poured. They need a lot of logistics attention in terms of installation of big equipment. Uh, they need a lot of fabrication of, let's say these kind of um, old school components like heat exchangers and things that are manufactured, let's say uh, in the country that the facility is being built. Uh, and so really a lot of these technologies are able to kind of um, pick up uh, a lot of these workforces that are already existing and, and hungry for work. Uh, and I think that's something that's fairly unique uh, to thermal energy storage, also applicable to hydrogen uh, storage or hydrogen production facilities. And so across the board, this is a really good opportunity. Um, the other aspect is that especially when it comes to industrial decarbonization, uh, these facilities are typically built uh, in, you know, not near cities, kind of in lower population uh, areas. And this is also where these uh, existing, uh, let's say, available skill sets are, are available. Uh, and so both uh, spatially, it's kind of a, an opportunity uh, to, to pick up workforces that maybe have been left behind, uh, especially with the decommissioning of certain energy assets. Yeah, those are good points. And, and Ben has mentioned geologic storage and uh, certainly some, some transition, workforce transition opportunities for drilling and, and wells uh, as, as well. Uh, I wanna get to another question. What are some of the key grid or infrastructure transformation issues that need to be addressed to permit the integration and utilization of customer owned assets like energy storage? Sort of a broad question. Uh, maybe Daryl? 
I, you know, uh, Clifford, I often say our biggest problem is between the ears. It's how we think. And unfortunately, the energy industry has been very siloed for a long time. So we have gas utilities, electric utilities, nuclear operations. They're all separated by completely separated network systems, expertise, ways of thinking. And, and what we need in the future world is a much more holistic and integrated approach. Um, at times in the past, we have had gas and electric utilities, but typically they end in divorce. And what we need are truly energy utilities that look at the energy system in a comprehensive way. And this is where storage comes into, into play in a very strong uh, manner. And, and whether it's uh, uh, electron storage in, in the, the form of batteries or gaseous storage in the form of hydrogen or, or pumped hydro storage or ground uh, compressed air storage, all of these different systems, if they're going to work in harmony, we have to have new ways of planning and organizing ourselves and organizing our utilities so that we're looking at our energy system as a comprehensive whole rather than these multiple silos where we've got liquid fuels to get around, electricity to keep the lights on and gas to keep us warm. Uh, as long as there's three solitudes, there's not a holistic set of thinking ar around these areas. And this is one of the major problems for the, the uh, breakthroughs in energy storage thinking is it, the discussion is too fractured. Um, the regulators that per, you know, permit uh, these projects to be incorporated into the rate base, um, in many jurisdictions, you have two completely different uh, bifurcated regulators looking after gas and electricity, or even if they're one regulator, they kind of have two departments. And so they don't know how to integrate these projects that cross boundaries. So this is where I think the biggest problem is once we start to look at our systems as an integrated whole ac across transportation energy, gaseous energy and electrical energy, we'll start seeing the, the critical role that storage will play uh, in, in the future energy economy. Great, thank you, uh, Daryl. Uh, moving on to some other questions we have. Um, let's see, there's a question on uh, the availability of energy storage. In other words, if you store energy in a battery, there's a lot of availability or exergy, some would call it. If you do thermal storage and you wanna convert that to electricity or hydrogen production, you take a hit. Ways to think. Um, so, I guess the question might be: uh, uh, what, what, maybe, what is the uh, benefit of energy? What are the technologies for energy storage given this acknowledgement of availability? Uh, Hannah, do you want to take something? Try to address this one. I can reflect a little bit on this challenge when we were looking at uh, for a Department of Energy EERE uh, lab call. We're looking at the coupling of all renewable hydrogen with iron and steel making. And one of the key tasks we had to perform was an extra G analysis because in concept, you could see all this waste heat availability at the iron facility and think that it could power your hydrogen system, let's say you're using a liquid organic carrier such as toluene to store your hydrogen in a form that can be stored for long duration. Well, it takes heat and uh, it releases heat during the different stages of putting that hydrogen molecule on and off toluene. However, when we looked at this system, we were looking at the exergy and we found it was a real research gap to understand what equipment was necessary to successfully couple a steady supply of waste heat at different temperatures with intermittent demand for waste heat. So this really was a key challenge. And one of the things we identified was to be very cautious with our assumptions around the source of thermal energy for our energy storage systems. And so we took a conservative approach to assume that it would be powered by natural gas and not waste heat initially. So it wouldn't be a completely carbon-free solution. We also made a recommendation to the industry to use the adoption of new technologies to reevaluate their cur current practices. So if there's opportunities for using waste heat for their own systems that just haven't been done before, take advantage of this opportunity to retrofit the facility um, and use these very expensive, sometimes exergy analysis evaluations to leverage uh, the facility as a whole. Hmm. Really interesting. Just Clifford, I was... 
I yeah, was remembering uh, a, an outstanding paper I remember from your organization, Sandia, about 12 or 14 years ago, when, when Sandia said, look, on, across all these different energy storage technologies, there's about 10 or 12 different variables that need to be brought into the discussion. And, and of late, there's been a lot of kind of simplistic talk and obsession with lithium ion batteries, which is a wonderful solution that can do many things, but it cannot solve all of our energy storage challenges. And you need to bring that rich analysis of 10 or 12 variables into the discussion to understand which energy storage solution is going to supply what need. And so I think we need to move away from the, the simplistic discussion and obsession with lithium and batteries and start to understand energy storage in a much more nuanced way. And I think that's what our questioner is bringing out very astutely. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Um, time check, we only have just a few more minutes left. So uh, a few more questions, if our panelists could answer um, as succinctly as possible. One is on hydrogen again. Can hydrogen expand to include other production methods? such as electromechanical water separation. So I'll do that one quickly. And indeed there's seven or nine different methodologies of landing on hydrogen. They all have their place, much like I was just saying, uh, it's kind of a horses for courses thing and, and you can't obsess about one pathway over another. Often there's tension between so-called blue hydrogen coming from renewable sources versus, uh, sorry, green hydrogen from renewable sources versus blue from fossil fuel sources. Each of these has a different profile of availability, of economics, et cetera. Uh, but yes, we can get to hydrogen many different ways and that's the benefit. Across the world, it's one of the most democratized forms of energy that can be executed in many different places in many different ways. Thank you. I've got another question. Does anyone know of any energy storage technology that has the energy intensity to power industry that can provide the energy 24 hours per day? So I guess we're talking long duration, going into seasonal even. Uh, anybody want to take this one? The longest duration storage methodologies today are either pumped hydro or compressed air. It's very interesting that pumped hydro grew up as we started to grow our nuclear capability in North America, and we needed some long duration absorption of the, the large amounts of energy that comes from baseload nuclear across a fluctuating demand profile. Um, so in the range of continuous multi-day, multi-month technologies, you're down to pumped hydro, hydrogen, compressed air are probably the largest scale solutions, but they also need to be coupled with other technologies. So I give the example of pumped hydro and nuclear. You can couple hydrogen with nuclear, with hydro, uh, with renewable energy. So there is no one solution that stands on its own, but together with storage, yes, you can have continuous good, strong baseload supply from the combinations of these solutions with large scale storage. There's also uh, multiple technologies that are kind of at the earlier stage that are being developed and they they can serve as these kind of discharge over 24 hours or, or more. Uh, one of them is Antora, Malta, Form Energy. And one common characteristic of all these different technologies is that you can decouple the, the storage elements or the energy element from the power element of the system. And what that means is that you're able to get cost competitiveness at extreme long durations and you can tailor uh, like the, the uh, storage hours or storage days quantity to your specific uh, customer need. And so you're able to leverage some kind of uh, economies of scale there. So we are almost at time. Uh, what I'd like to ask, and I put everyone on the spot here, I'd like to ask you all to just give just a lightning round closing statement, if you wouldn't mind, uh, just a few seconds on what you're taking away from energy intense industry and maybe uh, energy storage. So I'm just gonna go across the top here, uh, starting with uh, Adrian. There's a lot of great technologies out there uh, that are that exist and are ready to go, but the hardest part is getting a demonstration site, and this is what we need to move forward as fast as we can. Hannah. I fully support that statement, and I think a key research gap is understanding the integration of these systems. When we talk about high temperature, we also need to talk about delivering high temperature. So there needs to be systems analysis coupled closely with the people making the new materials or new systems. Ben? Yes, I really resonate with the need to have demonstration projects. I think we should start planning now and make sure we have very clear scientific and engineering goals uh, and bring in all of the 
you know, the engineering and science folks in so that we can plan how to, to make these transitions. Sorry. And finally, Daryl. Let me quote a friend who works in the industry. He said, one day we're going to wake up and realize that all these four hour lithium ion battery sites that we built was not the right way to go. We need a much broader diversity of solutions. So my final comment is, let's be smart about energy storage and let's be talking about it in a much richer way and not a simplistic way uh, as we have been in recent years. Great points, great takeaways. On behalf of all of our distinguished panelists, Adrian, Hannah, Ben, Daryl, my name is Cliff Ho, and I thank you all for attending this breakout session on energy intense industries. Please click back on your virtual platform back to the program uh, to join the next session. Thank you. <laughs>